I'm Elizabeth Luard. Welcome among the Ruthenes, a corner of the Ukraine marooned in Slovakia by war and the politician's pencil. A small holding provides the necessities of life, with shepherding and woodcutting as the traditional occupations. We're in the foothills of the High Tatras, and Simon's invited me to share the woodcutter's midday meal. The potatoes are already simmering in the pot. That looks like the original food processor, a peeled branched twig from one of the pine trees. In goes the cornmeal to make a thick porridge. Potato and maize, cornmeal, are both relative newcomers to the European table. Before Columbus brought back the new world vegetables, we would have had to be content with turnips and one of our native grains, barley, rye or oats, as in the Celtic porridge, or buckwheat, the Russian and Polish staple. <laughs> Bacon for the topping. This is home cured, salted but not smoked. It's firm and dense textured. Very valuable stuff in the winter to source the carbohydrates and keep out the cold. Fried down until it's crisp with home churned butter. Beautiful stuff. Pozor na praštěk. Uh -huh. Pale and creamy. Absolutely guaranteed additive free. It's all ready. A fine pot of cheer. Visitors get the lid of the pot. And a mouthful of hay for the workhorse who has to pull the logs home. To balance the meal, there's sauerkraut salt pickled cabbage. The secret of fermenting food for conservation, sauerkraut, curd cheese, sad milk, came from the Orient, from China, courtesy of the Tatars from Mongolia, who ruled much of Russia for two centuries. And plenty of bacon and butter sauce to keep out the cold. The Ruthene population of northeastern Czechoslovakia numbers around 50,000. Roughly one Ruthene for every hundred Slovaks. Not a large enough minority to threaten the state, which may account for their success in hanging on to their cultural identity and language. <laughs> The sheep are after a bit of spring grass. They've been inside all winter. And there's a nip of home-brewed Borovitska for me. This ancient instrument is the Fujara. It's reckoned to be of Mongolian origin. Here the sheep yield three crops, wool, winter fleeces sheared at the beginning of summer, meat and skins, slaughtering is in the autumn. 
and in spring through summer, there is milk for cheese, storable protein which can be exchanged for cash. At the moment, in April, the Shumiak Shepherding Cooperative is milking once a day for home consumption. The milk is turned to curds with rennet. Lovely, fresh, sweet curd. Put to drain, creamy and rich. Round here, it's usually eaten fresh or used to stuff dumplings. If it's salted and matured, it becomes storable cheese. The potato, most important of the New World's contributions to Europe's cooking pot, took longest to achieve acceptance. But when it did, it became the mainstay of the peasant diet. Here it's prepared as noodle dumplings, halushki, one step up the culinary ladder from porridge, requiring a cook's skill and a spoonful of salt. The starchy juices from grating the potatoes is used as the binding liquid for the dumplings. And you add just as much flour as is needed to make a very soft dough. The mixture goes onto a small wooden board for easier handling. The water's boiling, ready for the halushki. Scraped dough is surely the most primitive form of fresh pasta. In go the little halushki. Very neat. Something between the German dumpling and the Chinese noodle. I'm allowed to wear the best Sunday bonnet. Married ladies have to wear their hair up and covered. Home cured smoked bacon for the finishing touch. Everyone round here keeps a household pig to eat up the scraps. In the bottom of the pot is the last of the sauerkraut. The lid's that shape, so you can pour water round to seal it. All the ingredients are homegrown and home produced. The only thing the Jigax needed to buy was salt. The little dumplings are removed with a sieve, drained and dropped straight into the sauerkraut. The cold juices stop the cooking process and dressed with the bacon. The fat stops the dumpling sticking. There's a fine bowl of halouski, ready for the return of the shepherds from the milking. I get a preview straight from the spoon. The best sauce for this is a hearty appetite after a day on the hill. <laughs> a meal without bread would not be a meal at all, and it's quickly done. This is, after all, a nomadic tradition, and there's no time to mess about. Flour, salt, and baking soda. Mixed with enough soured milk to make a very soft dough. You find these flatbreads all over Northern Europe, in Scandinavia, Ireland, Scotland, and throughout the territory of the Celts. Nowadays, baking soda makes the bread lighter, but in the old days, this would have been leavened only by light fingers. Pat and roll it out, and on it goes, straight onto the top of the stove. In the old nomadic days, the bread would have been baked in the base of that same iron cooking pot which the woodcutters used for their porridge. It looks delicious, and it's so simple. The Ruthines of Ludomirova have kept their Eastern Orthodox faith and celebrate Easter on the old Gregorian calendar, a week or two later than the Western Church. Easter is the most important family festival in the Orthodox Church calendar. At this time, everyone goes home to be with their relatives. 
These days, too, the resurgence of nationalism in the Soviet Union has brought visitors from the Ukraine's capital, Kiev, in search of the traditions this relic population has managed to preserve. It's Good Friday, and Christ is symbolically carried out to the tomb. Church and congregation is in mourning, and remain so until the Mass of the Resurrection. This congregation is Pravoslav, or right-hand Orthodox. The monastery church of Ludomirova was founded after the Russian Revolution in 1917 by 50 Russian monks. With Stalin in the Kremlin and the Eastern Bloc dominated by Russia, the Pravoslavs were well funded and the services the monks offered were subsidized and therefore considerably cheaper than their Roman Catholic rivals, giving them the edge among a rural community well aware that prudence and frugality are the essence of good husbandry. Anna Zelizhnak and her daughter Luba have invited me back home to help prepare the Easter food. First we are to make the babka, the sweet bread, which is to be the centerpiece of the Easter meal. Yeast and milk, a little sugar to help the yeast, two packets of vanilla sugar, some extra dried milk because the household cow has not yet calved and Anna doesn't think the bought milk is creamy enough. Mama Anna is the expert. These skills are handed down by example. There is no written recipe or measurements, just an understanding of texture and temperature. In goes the milk. Preparations go on all day. Tomorrow is Easter Sunday and the food is to be packed in a basket and taken to church to be blessed. And the flour, enough to take up the milk. A good handful of salt. The eggs have to be separated. The yolks go in first and the whites are to be whisked. In go the egg yolks. The yeast beginning to work already, helped by that extra something in the wood of the dough trough. The most primitive cakes are these enriched bread doughs, raised with yeast, the fungi culture which forms naturally on fermented liquor. The organisms multiply when given the right conditions, warmth, starch and moisture, and produce carbon dioxide to aerate the dough. Plenty of melted butter, And in go the egg whites. You have to get as much air into the dough as you can. We're in for 20 minutes of this. And I've retired to the sidelines, completely wiped out, no stamina. <laughs> And it's beaten Luba as well. Now the next generation's had to take over. I don't feel so bad now. We're on a relay system. My turn now. The wood fire is built on the oven floor. As it burns, the oven bricks heat. The dough is going under a cloth for a rest, probably as exhausted as we were. The flowering willow, which decorates the house, is a talisman of rebirth, the first sign of spring. 
The next job is making the Easter egg cheese, a very unusual dish. The end result will look like a gigantic egg. Two liters of milk is brought to the boil. We need 20 eggs. The household gets through prodigious amounts of them at Easter. Eggs are prohibited food during the 40-day Lent fast. But the hens who are not brooding a clutch of spring chicks keep right on laying, so there's quite an accumulation to be used up. A tablespoonful of salt, well whisked together, and into the hot milk to be boiled up. Babka dough waits for no one. The first of the batch is given a special Easter shape, a plat. Easter is a feast of death and resurrection, and this braid may well be a reminder of pre-Christian times, when on the death of her husband, the widow's long plait of hair, pinned up since her wedding day, was cut off as a sacrifice and placed in her husband's grave. And the bread's ready to be put to rise again. This one's for the basket. We're making twisted ropes to form a cross to decorate the church bread. On everyday bread, the sign of the cross is made just with your hand before it goes into the oven. The custard's well scrambled and ready to go into its cloth to drain. This will give it the egg shape. And put to drip by the stove. The babkas have doubled their bulk and get a goose feather brush full of beaten egg to gild them. And the oven's hot enough. They'll take about 40 minutes to bake. The egg cheese is still dripping. And while the babkas bake, we can get on with painting the Easter eggs. The pattern's drawn on with melted candle wax. For a pen, you use a pin, a lace pin with a big head stuck into a stick holder. The wax can be colored, although plain is more traditional. Colored candle ends will do fine. You dab on a blob and drag the wet wax to make the pattern. And then the eggs are dipped in dye to throw the wax pattern into relief. It's the same technique as batik. The babkas are looking superb, light as a feather. A little butter to give extra sheen. And here's our egg cheese. Doesn't it look fine? A feather full of raw egg and in the oven for 15 minutes to get a nice shiny skin. It's Easter Sunday morning and everyone's in their Sunday best. Time to pack the Easter basket. Hard-boiled eggs dyed red in the bottom. In goes the babka. And symbolically, all the important stores, ham, sausage, bacon, salt, butter, cheese, flour, wax-patterned eggs on the top. All covered with a specially embroidered cloth. Every family has brought a basket. Tangible evidence of gratitude to the Almighty for a store cupboard which lasted through the winter and hope that the promise of spring will lead to good harvests in the coming year so that next year's store cupboards may be as well stocked.
roots of this ceremony go deep. In rural communities, the church inherited the responsibilities of its pagan predecessors and took on the blessing of the seed corn and the welcoming of the returning sun as part of its celebrations of the resurrection. <coughs> There's the echo, too, of an old pagan custom when families went to the churchyard to share a feast with their dead, which survived into Christian times. The importance of good relationships between the living and the dead is more keenly felt by isolated, self-sufficient communities. The Feast of the Spirit has been marked with due ceremony, so we're all off home for the Feast of the Flesh. Mama Anna gets us organized. There's still the setting out to be done. Festival food must be a treat, the exact opposite of the usual diet. So you never serve soups, porridges or vegetables, and always include sweet things like the babka. The egg custard slices up just like cheese. Meat is the real treat. The finest ham and the last of the home cured sausage and smoked bacon a sign of careful husbandry to have some still left over from the autumn pig killing. Fresh spring cheese. Mama Anna makes her own relishes, grated horseradish in a very mild vinegar and sugar pickle, and grated pickled beetroot. Very refreshing and delicately flavoured. This household keeps a well-stocked store cupboard. There is no fresh food yet. The earth hasn't yet warmed up enough. So we light the candle as a symbol of the light of Christ returning to the world. In pagan times, the flame would have been to encourage and strengthen the sun. Talking of fire, Elios has brought out the fire water, herb-flavoured Borovitska. After grace, we pay our dues to older gods, and everyone has a sip of the same raw egg, quite literally sharing the ancient symbol of renewal. In Ruthenia, there's no need to teach anyone's grandmother how to suck eggs. Easter is a time for families to be together. Just checking we're up to full strength today. <laughs> and the festival meal binds everyone with experience shared. Time to introduce the newest members to the old customs, so the tradition can go on. Thank <laughs> you. 